Today as part of our e-learning initiative, I on behalf of the Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery at MGM Dental College and Hospital welcome you to this module on mandibular anesthetic techniques in dentistry. We shall be dealing with the inferior alveolar nerve block technique in this four part video series. The various aspects of this commonly practiced technique are dealt with in detail by our esteemed faculty members in each part. We have designed this video series to be an interactive learning platform and as such I request you to keep a pen and paper handy to write the answers to the pause points placed at relevant intervals during the videos. Now let's begin with the introduction to the inferior alveolar nerve block technique. The technique we are talking about today is also referred to as the pterygomandibular nerve block the Halstead technique or the standard mandibular nerve block technique. The technique as the name implies blocks the inferior alveolar nerve which is a sensory branch of the mandibular nerve which is in turn a branch of the fifth cranial nerve that is the trigeminal nerve. The inferior alveolar nerve block technique is indicated when we are working with either one or more of the mandibular teeth of the same quadrant or soft tissue procedures to be carried out along the lingual mucoperiosteum or floor of mouth and the anterior two thirds of the tongue and the buccal soft tissue anterior to the mental foramen. This technique is a nerve block technique where the nerve trunk is anesthetized as against an infiltration technique where the terminal nerve endings are anesthetized. The reason for using a nerve block technique here is that once the fibers of the inferior alveolar nerve enter the mandibular foramen, they become inaccessible for local anesthetic delivery because they are surrounded by dense cortical bone. I now hand over to my colleague for the discussion on the hard and soft tissue landmarks and the nerves anesthetized by this technique. In this section on the series on inferior alveolar nerve block, we will dwell into the hard and soft tissue landmarks relevant to this block and the nerves anesthetized. We all know that in order to achieve profound anesthesia by any block technique, the needle has to be inserted such that its tip lies in close proximity to the nerve and that the solution, that is the local anesthetic solution, is deposited around the nerve to be anesthetized. Talking about the inferior alveolar nerve, we therefore have to have a clear understanding of the bony topography of the medial surface of the ramus of the mandible and the inferior alveolar nerve itself before it enters the mandibular foramen on the medial surface of the ramus of the mandible. At this point, let's pause. Have a close look at the structures which have been marked on the medial surface of the ramus of the mandible. Note down the significance of these structures after identifying them as it relates to the inferior alveolar nerve block. Now let's quickly run through the answers for these questions on the structures which have been marked and let's see how many you were close to getting them right. The first is the lingula, a small lip of bone which overlies the mandibular foramen and attaches the sphenomandibular ligament and the lingula actually marks the position of the mandibular foramen itself. The mandibular foramen marks the point of entry of the inferior alveolar nerve into the mandible and is in fact the target area around which we would like to deposit the local anesthetic solution before the nerve enters the mandible. The mandibular sulcus is the area of depression contiguous with the mandibular foramen and is also the target area for the needle around the mandibular foramen. The internal oblique ridge is the anterior bony prominence or elevation on the medial surface of the ramus of the mandible immediately behind which lies the mandibular foramen. In case of an early bony hit, the needle is in contact with this 
anterior bony elevation namely the internal oblique ridge incidentally the internal oblique ridge also continues forward to form the medial edge of the retromolar trigone now that we have seen about the target area and the topography immediately surrounding it we need to realize that none of these landmarks are actually palpable clinically on the surface so what we need to look for are surface landmarks which can be palpated precisely and repeatedly while executing this block the mandibular foramen as you can see lies midway between the anteroposterior dimension of the ramus of the mandible hence trying to assess this dimension by placing a finger on the anterior border of the ramus of the mandible intraorally and at the same time placing another finger along the posterior border extraorally will give us a broad idea about the dimension of that particular ramus and the approximate location of the mandibular foramen having a feel of this anteroposterior dimension will help us to visualize where exactly the target area lies now take a pause discuss with your peers and try to locate hard and soft tissue landmarks on the surface which would serve as a repeatable guide coronoid notch is the deepest portion on the anterior border of the ramus and as you can see the coronoid notch is in line with the level of the mandibular foramen so it is therefore a very stable hard tissue landmark which is easily accessible on the surface and can be used as a reliable guide to locate the vertical level of the mandibular foramen the coronoid notch can be reached by palpation of at the external oblique ridge which is a bony prominence or an elevation on the lateral aspect of the body of the mandible and is contiguous with the anterior border of the ramus and hence the coronoid notch but how do you locate the external oblique ridge you need to start your palpation of the mucobuccal fold which is a soft tissue landmark run your finger backwards and feel for the external oblique ridge which is a body prominence which begins around the first molar now let's shift our focus to a very very important soft tissue landmark on the medial surface of the ramus of the mandible namely the pterygo mandibular rapid can we now take a pause and try to recapitulate what goes to form the pterygo mandibular rapid you can discuss with your peers and try to pin down your answers Pterygomandibular rapid is a firm fibrous ligamentous band of tissue which is formed by the insertion of the buccinator muscle laterally and the superior constrictor muscle medially and it is attached from the pterygoid amulus above which is a part of the medial pterygoid plate runs downwards and laterally to be attached or inserted into the posterior end of the mylohyoid line the key point is that The pterygomandibular rapid is again a very very reliable and repeatable soft tissue landmark which marks the medial boundary for the area of insertion of the needle during this block taking it a little bit further it means that if you were to inadvertently insert your needle medial to the pterygomandibular rapid you will have to realize that the needle would be passing through the fibers of the superior constrictor muscle of the pharynx which would cause the patient to gag and ultimately also pierces through the fibers of the medial pterygoid muscle resulting in the post operative complication of trismus the target area of the needle lies within the pterygomandibular space now what is this pterygomandibular space it is a potential space on the medial surface of the ramus of the mandible aptly called so because it is bound by the pterygoid muscles and the medial surface of the ramus of the mandible on three now let's pause here to have a close look at this picture and try to note down what are the structures which are going to form the boundary of this pterygomandibular space now let's pause here to have a close look at this picture and try to note down what are the structures which are going to form the boundaries of this pterygomandibular space This space is bounded laterally by the medial surface of the ramus of the mandible 
medially by the lateral surface of the medial pterygoid muscle, posteriorly by the deep lobe of the parotid gland, superiorly by the lateral pterygoid muscle, and anteriorly by the pterygomandibular raphe formed by the decussation of the fibers of the vaccinator and the superior constrictor muscle. It is equally important to know the contents which lie within this space. As you can see, it includes the inferior alveolar nerve and its accompanying vessel, the nerve to the mylohyoid, the lingual nerve and the sphenomandibular ligament. A closer look will help us understand how these structures are disposed or laid out within this space. If you note the lingual nerve is located anteromedial to the inferior alveolar nerve and to be precise is almost at a halfway distance between the surface and the inferior alveolar nerve. One more important point to note is that between the anterior border of the ramus of the mandible, which we all agree is a stable bony landmark, and the pterygomandibular raphe, which is a soft tissue landmark, lies an inverted triangle which is known as the pterygotemporal depression. The pterygotemporal depression is significant because it marks the point of insertion of the needle during the execution of the inferior alveolar nerve block. Now, let's do a quick recap and note down all the hard and soft tissue landmarks that you've seen so far as relevant to the inferior alveolar nerve block along with its significance and pen it down on a piece of paper. Now, let's move to the nerves that are anesthetized by the inferior alveolar nerve block technique. It includes the inferior alveolar nerve itself before it enters the mandibular foramen, the mental nerve which is one of its branches and exits through the mental foramen on the lateral surface of the body of the mandible and the lingual nerve which lies anteromedial to the inferior alveolar nerve. At this point, I would like you to pause the video again and based on the information that we have on the nerves which are anesthetized by the inferior alveolar nerve block, can you pin down the structures which are going to be anesthetized following the execution of this block? The structures anesthetized would include the pulps of the teeth right from the third molar up to the midline on the side of the injection, lingual gingiva, floor of the mouth and the anterior two-thirds of the tongue again on the side of the injection and the buccal mucoperiosteum from the mental foramen up to the midline. Now that we have seen the hard and soft tissue landmarks, the boundaries of the pterygomandibular space, the nerves anesthetized, and the area which is going to be anesthetized following an inferior alveolar nerve block, I would like to hand over to my colleague who would speak to you on the armamentarium which is important for executing this block.